Um, I was told, and I think it's true, we don't really have any uh, announcements formally, that, but do any of you have any announcements that we should be left out? Yes, Kim.
B, C. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Our opening hymn will worship the King.
One of the realizations that we're always seeing in after the 4-H fair was over and we got back home and started settling into the, what I thought of as late summer routine was that school was right around the corner. And we all know that that's kind of an unusual situation this year. So I'll be praying about what's going on with returning to school, decisions, how families are going to deal with that, the community. And, and also, uh, just be asking God perhaps to be opening our eyes and our ears to be attentive to some of those that perhaps are not as well equipped as many of us are blessed to be. Uh, maybe some of those who live in a community that don't have family nearby uh, for whom it might be a huge problem to try to figure out what to do. Uh, so uh, let's be attentive to that and Perhaps there might be some opportunities for ministry there. And then the other thing along with that, be praying about how we're going to start to embrace whatever it looks like to be doing those ministries that have kind of been put on pause for a time that we want to be recognizing that need to be happening in some way or another. So uh, let's be praying about those things too as well. Well, if you're ready, let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, one of your servants, Douglas Steer, would say, in response to the question, are we ready? That your spirit would remind us that we are always ready. That you are ready. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we come to you not out of a willy-nilly or presumptuous awareness, but out of the awareness in gratitude and joy that you are ready. Ready to comfort us, to heal us, to forgive, to give new life, to give us peace. We pray, gracious Father, for Lyle, that you would strengthen. We thank you for some encouragement that the last day or so has been better. We pray that your spirit would continue to strengthen his spirit and his body to bring healing and refreshment. We ask for Brad in what appears to be the ending of this journey on earth. First of all, God, we, we know that you are a God who hears our cries, so we continue to ask for your mercy, your favor, your healing upon him. And we pray that you would guide and direct these steps, and if this would be the ending of this journey, that you might be able to step forward in you into the perfect healing that awaits us all. Or if it's more for your glory, that you would strengthen him so that he might continue to serve yet in this community. We pray for Kent, Sharon's cousin, for his friends who are suffering with COVID. We ask, oh God, that you would continue to meet their needs, bring recovery and strengthening. We praise you and rejoice for new life, for Roger's opportunity to hold this precious new grand, great grandchild and to rejoice and be glad. We praise you for little Roman and Trisha's ongoing health and recovery and that Ron and Sharon are excited about the opportunity to 
travel later this week to visit, to hold, to love. And gracious Lord, as we are here this morning, we remember that your spirit is with us. Holding us, soothing us, reminding us that we are dearly loved. Helping us to then see the joy and the gladness of sharing that truth, that hope, that celebration with others. At all the various stages in life, Lord, help us to always respond to your spirit. And if perhaps we're slow to respond, to then take that next time when you make us aware. To share in the simple joys and excitements of winning that first race or seeing the opportunity to share in life and hope. We do pray for decisions in the community, Father, that are a bit unusual this year. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the living of these days. This and all that's upon our hearts and minds we bring to you in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught his church to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
really should receive, and other times you encourage us just to share what we have uh, and, and to be glad that we have leftovers for ourselves to be able to pull out and feed, especially unexpected guests that might drop into life. And as a church, help us to always be aware that you promise to provide what we need, the resources that are necessary for us to do the mission to which you call us. We ask this all in Jesus' name.
My dad, it was late in the fall, we were finishing up harvest, and all the bins were full. And so my dad told my brothers and I, got uh, three different wagons loaded up and said, take them to the elevator. And when you get there, and they ask for what's going to be put on the ticket, tell them it's for the church. So we each did. We, we each had a different tractor we ran into town with, we pulling a wagon behind us. And got there, and we got on the scale and checked in, and told them for the Lake and United Methodist Church. That was the first time I'd ever done that. Not the first time I'd taken a load of grain. Not the first time I'd ever taken a load of grain and told them a different name. Other than Ralph and Charles Weir. And what struck me about that was understanding God's faithfulness. Understanding God's faithfulness. You're, you're familiar probably with some of those great accounts we have from God's saints that are recorded in the scriptures, as well as just the accounts that you've heard in testimonies from folks you've been around or some of you have shared, of how God has abundantly met our needs. Like Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, where he, he goes on to say that not only does God return, but it's pressed down, shaken together far more abundantly, running over more than what the bins are full. Now you also know that that's not always the case. There are times that maybe the bins aren't full at the end of the harvest. But the abundance of God nonetheless meets our needs, provides for us, and for the ministry to which God has called us. And that's part of what struck my mind as I was starting to think about Colossians 4 was that there was something more that God wanted us to just allow our minds and our hearts to be centered upon here this summer, especially this year. You are God's chosen one. I don't want to encourage you to be thinking about theological arguments. Maybe you've been spared those, but I remember as a youth, one of the things that I was privileged to do as a youth was to serve on lay witness missions and youth mission teams. And it seemed like invariably on a lot of those weekends, folks would want to debate about whether everybody was saved or whether there were only certain folks who were chosen and elected by God to be saved and everybody else was damned whether we had any way of dealing with that or responding to that God's word says that Jesus came and gave his life for all that everybody would have the opportunity to receive forgiveness, reconciliation, be restored to God, receive righteousness, and live the life that they were created to have. But that unless we receive that, we're already dead. Paul says, out of Paul's experience, remembering, remember, or, or recall if you can, or not, go back and read in Acts, Paul's experience, born into a devout Jewish family, raised in faithfulness, steeped in what it means to love God, so much so that he literally gave his life to observing God's law, teaching God's love, receiving teaching from others, and seeking to give everything to make sure that folks were faithful, 
So much so that when these folks started talking about Jesus, he wanted to make sure that people weren't misled. So that he went and did everything he could to be sure that that falsehood was stamped out. Nobody would be led astray. And in the midst of that, he met Jesus. So Saul, Paul, understood that one can be mistaken, that one can be passionately devoted to what they think is true and right, only to discover later on perhaps it's idolatrous, if not outright falsehood. They've taken their eyes off the Lord and instead are focused too much on ritual or traditions. And so as he's speaking to the church, here he's reminding us, first and foremost, you are God's chosen ones. You and I have life and hope because God has chosen for us to have that opportunity to experience life and redemption. God has taken the initiative in your personal as well as in the whole church and in fact all the universe drama of salvation. And God continues to make available to all of us the opportunity to know His favor, His strength, His power, and His Spirit's presence. So that no matter the circumstances in which we happen to be living today, we can be confident in an eternal hope. A hope that calls us to be honest about the fact that we have a new life. Honest with God, honest with ourselves, and especially honest with each other. And that's what Paul was writing about in this part of the letter, reminding these folks in the church to not be sidetracked, to not be misled, to not be distracted by all of those important things that are a part of life and in its expressions in living, but to always remember who we are. And because of who we are, how we are empowered by God's new life in Jesus Christ in the presence of the Spirit to live. That we are offered by God's mercy and grace the opportunity to live into what it means to be holy and loved. As Jesus understood his unique relationship with the Father in the oneness of the Trinity, that he was the beloved Son, the same language is used about us. Even as we are struggling and wrestling with maybe not always being perfectly faithful. Yet in Jesus Christ, our Father wants us to know that we are holy and beloved because of Christ Jesus. His covering grace and mercy that not only covers you, but in the power of God's Spirit has been put into you to stir that new life, that hope, and that purpose. Because of that, we are glad to live a life of service. We're glad to live a life of service. Passing on to others the joy of Jesus. And there's so many ways in, way, in, in how this gets flashed out in our ordinary living. And, you know, the joy of having a grandson win his first race. The joy of holding the grandchild for the first time. The joy of, and it is a strange joy, but it's joy. The joy of seeing your mother take her last breath, knowing she is going to the feet of Jesus. Because you've experienced what it means to know 
God's holiness and love. And you're glad to live into that life of compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience. Holding out with each other, forbearing is the translation I read, but holding out, hanging in there with each other, not because you have to, but because Jesus is hanging in there with you. And as he hangs in there with you, he reminds us, this is what I'd like for you to do for others. Because everybody else around you needs to know the same love and mercy in their own life as you do. So hang on, forbear one another. And not grudgingly, even though there are probably times, at least in my life, when I have to admit that it's grudgingly, jumping towards the end, the part where Paul talks about what this means for our family relationships, Nancy has had to put up with the fact that she's married to a guy that sometimes tends to think that things just ought to be the way I want them to be all the time. And it's not true. And after she has done her best to try to reason with me, try to explain to me why things can't be that way, it usually takes God's spirit and the time when I'm pouting off to the side, God's spirit to whisper to me or, or, or maybe not whisper to me. How have you been loved? Remember I asked you to love her as Jesus loves the church. How is it that Jesus loves you and loves the church? Does he dictate how everything ought to be done? Or did he actually go to the cross and lay down his life in order to rescue and deliver you? It's amazing how the Holy Spirit can always say those things that I just need to hear. I don't really always want to hear at that moment, but what I need to hear. Because we're God's chosen ones. Because you're God's chosen ones, you can, in fact, put on Christ Jesus. And individually, but especially together, be the body of Jesus Christ. That our families, that this community, the whole world for that matter, of course, but especially those folks that you interact with that are in your sphere of influence, they need to meet Jesus. And Jesus, for whatever reason that I don't fully understand, but I'm glad he did, Jesus has chosen to let you and me be involved in the joy and the work of helping people to discover God's great love for them. And we don't even have to do all the hard work. Jesus did all the grunting and groaning literally on the cross so that you and I can lean our shoulders into doing what it is we're called to so that we can flesh out Jesus' love in fresh and new ways today. So that we can share honestly with folks how it is that Jesus has empowered us to be able to love folks who are unlovable. To put up with folks that no one else wants to put up with. To continue to hope for folks that everyone else thinks are hopeless. And to not always know how it turns out. Many years ago, we were serving in a congregation that had two ladies in that congregation who were both strong individuals, very gifted, but always at loggerheads. They were always like, Two rams button each other across the farmyard 
or bulls pushing each other around. So much so that it seemed like nothing ever got done. And exasperated, having prayed about it, not knowing exactly for sure what to do, I remember Matthew 18, Jesus teaching about forgiveness, verses 15 through 20. And so I called them both up and I said, I'd like for you to come to my office. I'd like to talk to you. And so they both came in at the appointed time, and after they were both shocked at the fact that she was there, sat down, and I just briefly stated the obvious, that we loved them both. They both loved the church. It was obvious they have both been around the church for, it seemed like, forever. And we were glad about that. However, they knew very well that they had issues. And it was a problem. So then I read Matthew 18 to them and talked a little bit about what that meant, talked about what it meant in my own life, in my own struggles, in understanding the perfecting pure love of Jesus and how I needed it every day, that it wasn't just a once and done kind of thing. And then invited them to pray and to ask the Lord to give them strength to begin to love one another. I said, you know, you don't have to like each other all the time. You don't even have to agree with each other. But we are called to live in love and service to the Lord together. And so we did. They left. Thought things went pretty well. Uh, the next time I saw one of the ladies, it was wonderful, and she was truly, not because of me, but because of God's word, God's spirit, had chosen to surrender that area of her life and determined to go forward and to be loving and gracious. The other gal, I found out from her brother-in-law that I had told her to go to hell. Which wasn't true. She did continue to come to church, continue to be active in the congregation. I don't know for sure how things turned out in her life. But I do know that recognizing that we are God's chosen ones, called to put on Christ Jesus, was exactly what I needed, what she needed, what that church needed. I suspect that may be the case right now in Fairbury, whether it's in the schools, whether it's our neighbors, whether it's our grandkids, whether it's me personally. God is inviting us to remember that we are in Jesus, his chosen ones to put on Christ Jesus. But it is important to have the witness of God's Spirit that we have. 1 Samuel 17 is the account of young David sent by his daddy to deliver some supplies to his older brothers with King Saul's army. And when he goes there, he gets distracted by all the shouting that's going on and finds out that there's this giant who is challenging day after day the people of Israel. And nobody will go out and fight him. And so David, as you know probably, says, I'll do it. So they take him to the king. And the king tries to talk him out of it because he's just a youth. He doesn't know what he's doing. And David says, well, first of all, I've kept the sheep for my father. And whenever a bear or a lion would snatch one, I would go and deliver them out of their mouth. And as the Lord has been with me, 
so the Lord will be with me against this uncircumcised Philistine. Saul tries to suit David up with all of his armor so that he can go out there in good conscience, knowing that at least he's tried to help the boy. But you know that David, it says, is not used to the armor, so he takes it off and he says, I can't do this. God will deliver. So he goes, and you probably know how it turns out. Slings that rock and stuns the giant and kills him with his own sword. We don't trust in our own strength, in our understanding of infectious diseases, in our great educational systems, in our family's traditions and heritage. All of those things are wonderful and marvelous resources, but we don't trust in those things. We trust in the fact that we are God's chosen ones who can put on Christ Jesus and love. Would you pray with me for a moment? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, just as David had to choose to trust you, to honestly put his life on the line, literally, that his hope was in you. Remind us Help us today to say, my hope is in the Lord God Almighty, in Jesus my Savior, the power of your precious spirit. Lord, empower each of us, especially your church, all of us, to live in humility and lowliness as the chosen ones, we're called to go out and put on Christ Jesus and share his love, his mercy, his favor, and invite, invite others to his healing grace. All this we pray in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. I am thine, O Lord.
that nearness of the power of God's Spirit shall not fail you or forsake you wherever you go. Go in peace and let us be glad. Amen.